My name is Graham Wetzberger. I'm the editor of The Conversations Undressed, a CSA national board member, and the incoming vice president of technology. I am delighted to be today's host for you and another Spotlight on Grads webinar. I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Danny Fuentes. Fuentes is the owner and curator of Lethal Amounts Gallery in Los Angeles and the apparel line of the same name. While Los Angeles Magazine called Lethal Amounts a punk rock art gallery, Fuentes described his curation as stuff that's weird and curious and doesn't necessarily have to fall into a category of fine arts to the LA Times, which I like a lot better. Additionally, Fuentes is an influencer in the music world, having been selected as a member of Rolling Stone's Culture Council. Uh, so before we get to our students presenting on their areas of study regarding subcultures, can you tell our audience a bit about your journey to how you ended up in this remarkable career? I started my, my journey with uh, essentially just having a background in screen printing. It was sort of my introduction into the more uh, sophisticated, uh, technical art world. Uh, I wanted it to just have an understanding of how the craft is. Um, I really just wanted to make my own t-shirts, to be honest with you, but uh, I got really inspired by it. And uh, I figured, why the hell not? You had to learn all these other graphic design classes and courses. And before I knew it, um, I had studied so many years in that field, I became somewhat of a master in screen printing. So I could do just about anything from textile to serographs, the more fine art, uh, you know, disciplines of screen printing. But uh, that became my sort of more fundamental uh, intro into the art world, if you will. And uh, that's kind of where my journey begins with uh, just wanting to do my own t-shirt line, my own clothing company. And it sort of didn't pan out the way I expected. I got a large studio space where I was working out of. And it just made sense for me to introduce the brand through its influences, through art, music, and culture, fashion, and all of the above. And lo and behold, I was really good at putting together art shows. And somehow, by year one, we were talking to David LaChapelle and Lee Black Childers and Nick Rock. And it was very clear that we were on to something. And why not continue on with that path? Why, why try to fix something that's not broken? So... We've been doing this for eight years now, and we are more recognized as a gallery than we are as a brand, but I'm okay with that. The brand will take up, will, will take on its own shape just like the gallery has. Yeah, let life take it where, you, where it will, right? Absolutely. You have to sometimes. You can't, you can't fight the universe. It, it just Sometimes it just opens doors for you. Can you talk a little bit about how – your love of music has influenced your career, your aesthetic, your curation in your art gallery and your fashion line? Uh, music is kind of uh, my religion, if you could say. If I could say I believe in one thing uh, wholeheartedly, it would be uh, music. I, I feel like I treat it very much like it, it, if it were my religion. Um, you know, I just find it's, it's an escape, you know, oftentimes. And I think a lot of the characters that I've grown to love have been interesting people that maybe have ha had hard upbringings that create a character for themselves that becomes a, 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 a some kind of like exoskeleton. You know, people like Boy George, for instance, or Pete Burns, you know, disenchanted, disenfranchised, you know, queer kids that were outsiders. Sometimes they're not queer necessarily, but they certainly would fall under that category of they're the weirder kids, they're the I mean, by today's standards, queer means something completely different than what it probably meant in for the sure. 70s. But, you know, those, those kids that you really see that, like, they created something for themselves to blossom into uh, just feeling alive and feeling better about their existence. Uh, so to me, it becomes a, a much deeper thing with music. Uh, I feel like there is a, there's a profound uh, – when people really get the image and the sound and the lyrics and there's this whole package, like, there's something very profound about that. It's creating a, it's creating an altered, an altered universe for yourself and, and all those that want to find peace and uh, looking, looking at you as like a hero, like the David Bowie's, for instance, you know, creating this completely alter ego, this alter existence, this storyline that's about, you know, I'm not, he wasn't from Earth and he came here to save Earth but got stuck on Earth. You know, the, all these characters that get developed and kids just see themselves in that, and I, I feel like that's something that I got lost in and. 
all the bands that I love, uh, they always have a sense of fashion, a sense of self. Uh, they create a sense of wor of worth worthiness in that. And, um, you know, oftentimes it has to be all of them to really hit me. Lyrically, imagery, um, you know, <laughs> I just it's more than just the sound for me. Oftentimes for sure. it's everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the words you're saying, uh, are very kind of prosaic and, and talking about you know using imagery to define a sense of self you know our topic tonight is subcultures and the kind of subsections or the subcultures themselves that our panelists our student panelists are talking about um you know and perhaps most subcultures are very much defined by their images and i think a lot of these groups too, and the panelists can maybe extrapolate more, you know, may have um, a, a, a musical genre that identifies them um, in some cases. In, in two of these cases, I think they're more obvious than maybe the, uh, the third, but, um, you know, it, it is a part, and music is certainly part of like the culture, right? Like, and like your sure. scene, where you fit in. And, but it's yeah. interesting that also one's, one's, interests in, in in anything cultural can, can cross subcultures and it can be you know for sure i feel like i tap into a few things uh and somehow they all have a thread running through them but uh it might not be obvious to to uh, the passerby but i think subculture in and of itself is uh they all kind of pour into each other somehow whether it be one feeds into the other or the numerous numerous levels to them that really overlap um but you know i think a lot of the things that i focus on really do tend to be connected somehow uh, and it, it usually is music <laughs> in yeah, some way cool um so this is enough talking for me i'm the host and not the moderator so i'm gonna let you take it and um, introduce our first panelist who is summer lee and uh, she's going to present her uh research project hi <laughs> Hey, Summer Lee, how are you? I'm good, nice to meet you, Danny. Very nice to meet you too. I'm excited to hear your presentation. Um, if you would be so kind, I was told that you will be introducing yourself. So by all means, take it away. I'm very eager to hear. Yeah, so my name is Summer. Uh, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm still in New York City. i um, getting my master's degree right now in fashion and textile studies at FIT, which I will talk a little bit more about um, at the beginning of my presentation. Um, but I just want to say that over the past two years, um, studying the study of fashion and the history of fashion has really made me so passionate about the storytelling capabilities in clothing. And I just love figuring out like, how do you express that through an exhibition in a gallery or a museum? And that's something that I also talk about in my presentation. Good evening, everyone. So my presentation is about my in progress thesis project, which is titled Emo Scene Spectrum of Subcultural Style. So I'm a current graduate student of fashion and textile studies at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, that is a two year program and I'm completing my final coursework this semester. Um, there's a conservation and a curation track of the program. And I'm pursuing a curatorial career and I was a curator of the Roaring Twenties and the Swinging Sixties graduate exhibition with the museum at FIT. And that was a 100% digital virtual exhibition that just opened last month in March of 2021. Uh, so a graduation requirement for this program is a qualifying paper, uh, which is essentially a thesis. And I had many different ideas for my thesis, but at the end of the day, I needed to pick one. Uh, so I landed on emo and scene style because I have a personal connection to it. And there's also a, a current relevance because these styles are popping up again on the internet and social media as millennials are feeling nostalgic about their teenage years and Gen Z is romanticizing a movement that they didn't get to experience. 
Uh, so I'll give a brief background into these styles in case anyone here tonight is unfamiliar with them. But I do want to plug that I'm also presenting on this subject at the CSA's National Symposium this May, and that is also a 100% digital event. So the word emo emerged from emo core, short for emotional hardcore as a genre of music. Uh, it has its roots in the 80s and 90s, but it really broke through to the mainstream mm -hmm. in 2002. And this 2004 photo depicts that early emo style, including these tight black band tees and tight jeans. Uh, in fact, I know that at least one of the young men in this photo is wearing his girlfriend's jeans or borrowing his girlfriend's jeans to get that uh, tight look. So then a few years mm -hmm. later, in the late 2000s, emo style refers to something that is overall much darker, uh, more black clothes, a very recognizable emo hairstyle of straight black hair with long bangs over one eye. And this is probably what a lot of people are very familiar with because there was an international media frenzy over emo, uh, particularly in the years 2007 and 2008, because it became associated with depression and life-threatening activities among children and teens. And finally, onto scene. So scene is considered an outgrowth of emo style because it took a lot of those emo basics uh, but it made it really over the top and colorful. So here you see very big teased straight hair and a really fascinating aspect of scene style is heavy incorporation of childish styling elements like tutus, tiaras and cartoons, especially Hello Kitty. So after I initially settled on this topic for my thesis, I was not sure exactly what shape this thesis is going to take. So my first steps were to begin conducting preliminary research, become well acquainted with subcultural theories as well as post subcultural theories and books that discussed emo. And I also wanted to look around online for where I could find primary sources of emo and scene kids actually discussing their style because that is such a huge benefit of all of this occurring with the internet and social media in existence. So when I was doing that research, I realized that what I really want to hone in on is the fluidity between emo and scene styles, because even if the previous photos I showed made emo and scene look really easy to tell apart, in practice, it was more complicated because emo and scene were often conflated and confused, like of course by outsiders, but also by insiders of the style, which is so interesting. And I remember this firsthand because I was a participant and I also found many primary sources online that express this confusion between like how to tell the styles apart as well. And this fluidity and the porous boundaries between the styles supports a lot of the post subcultural theories out there about how subcultures have fundamentally changed in postmodern society. And it also occurred to me that since the 2000s were not that long ago, uh, I thought I would have an easy time connecting with people and getting my hands on some emo and scene garments to photograph and study. And the first thing I did was I put out a call on Facebook and I got some interest from friends and friends of friends, but unfortunately nothing actually ever came of that. So then what I did was I went to a reselling app that I use called Depop, uh, D-E-P-O-P. -P, and I started searching for some related keywords and then I was engaging with sellers about their emo and scene days. And before I knew it, I had started purchasing things. So now I want to take you all on a tour of some of my emo and scene collection. Okay, so. The very first pieces I purchased were from a young woman named Natalie. Natalie told me that her scene phase began at the age of 11, and she feels it sort of ended by age 16, but feels like emo is still influential in her style today. 
she purchased these items between the years 2012 and 2017 and confirmed with me that she would have styled them all together. So as you can see, there is a costume tiara, a plush Hello Kitty backpack, and the black t-shirt reads, quote, me and Jesus are tighter than a pair of skinny jeans, word, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> um, Natalie was also kind enough to look for photos of herself wearing these items, which I would have loved to have uh, photos for you know, my records, but unfortunately she felt she must have lost the device that they were taken on. So that element of easily losing digital photographs is actually something that is, uh, is an issue with this topic and something I've come across in other places as well. Um, this here is the first part of my collection that I would consider like a full ensemble in that it has a top and bottoms and shoes are also a plus. Uh, they were collected from a woman named Paige who frequently wore this outfit in middle school. And she estimated between the years 2008 and 2010. The t-shirt features a character called Emily the Strange thinking about a broken heart and the bottoms are skinny jeans, which were so important for these styles. And the brand is Trip, uh, T-R-I-P-P, -P, which was a very popular brand for these darker styles. Mm -hmm. And the shoes feature another cartoon character, Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, here is another ensemble that I was very excited to obtain from a seller named Mickey who dated it from 2014 to 2015. So this would definitely be considered a part of like an emo revival uh, in music rather than, you know, the, the same bands that were being listened to by emo kids in the early 2000s. And there are a lot of bands that are represented in this look, um, which is why I was so excited to get it. So we see 21 Pilots, Fall Out Boy, my Chemical Romance, Panic at the Disco, and also uh, Nirvana. And then going towards the scene end of the spectrum, here are pieces I collected from a seller named Emmy. Uh, the dress is from Hot Topic by a brand named Skell Animals, which is all about cute little uh, cartoon figures of skeletal animals. And I definitely had some uh, Skell Animals merchandise back in the day myself. Emmy dated this dress to between 2013 and 2017. Um, you also see a pair of pink and black shoes. And I have the shoes with me on the table and maybe I can show them when I'm done presenting so that um, everyone could see them a bit bigger. But the pink and black shoes, she called them a scene staple item. And she also had this Yo Gabba Gabba plush backpack. So Yo Gabba Gabba was a children's show that aired between 2007 and 2015. Uh, and they also had a collaboration with the store Hot Topic, probably around 2009, because I also owned things from that collaboration uh, when I was younger. And this is the last piece of the collection that I want to highlight. It's this rainbow tutu. And I purchased it from a seller named Michaela, who wore it as a high school sophomore in 2009. It's very seen. And uh, she even remembered the exact eBay store that she purchased it from. Although uh, Michaela did not still own anything that she wore with it, because I asked, because I, I wanted to purchase the entire ensemble from her. Um, she didn't still own anything she wore with it, but she did actually have a photograph that she was able to send me. And I don't have permission to share that photograph, but I can tell you all that she wore black skinny jeans underneath the tutu and this exact Hello Kitty t-shirt. Um, and every now and again, I look online to see if anyone is selling it. And I haven't found it yet, but if anyone watching this owns this t-shirt, let me know because I might buy it from you. Um, so while I was collecting, 
I had been consulting this book, which is Surfers, Soli, Skinheads, and Skaters, Subcultural Style from the 40s to the 90s by Amy De La Haye and Kathy Dingwall. Um, I was actually lucky enough to once hear Amy De La Haye as a guest lecturer for my museum theory class, where she spoke about her work collecting subcultural style for the Victoria and Albert Museum's street style exhibition in the 90s and the process and the difficulties with that and between that lecture and this book, I could attempt to follow their collecting methodology, except with adaptations for the 21st century. And although I was having tons of fun on my emo and scene treasure hunt, I had yet to formally propose my thesis topic uh, to the board for approval. And I was still struggling with how to make it take shape. And then one night it finally hit me I realized I had been staring the idea in the face the entire time um, to do an exhibition. So uh, that wasn't a route that many past students had taken, but it had been done before. So with the help and support of an advisor who is very experienced in exhibiting fashion, I put together the proposal for my thesis project, uh, Emo Scene Spectrum of Subcultural Style. And the big idea, of this exhibition it would be to answer, how do you define emo and scene styles and how can you tell them apart? And my answer is that sometimes you can't tell them apart because there is so much fluidity between the two styles. And I should note that the project is not to actually mount this exhibition in a physical space. It is an academic paper between 30 and 50 pages long that describes different elements of what I imagine the exhibition would be. So that includes, of course, what objects in my collection, but also outside of my collection that I think would make the show the most successful. And also, you know, example section texts and object labels. And in addition to those more traditional elements, I also propose to include other things that I think are important like a discussion of how garments in this show should be mounted, what mannequins to use. Um, so here you see, I bought this lovely gray lady because uh, while I already owned a dress form for sewing, uh, that dress form couldn't wear pants, shoes, bracelets, or hats because it's literally just a torso. Um, and also this mannequin was heavily discounted because she was used and damaged. And she gets the job done in that all the clothes fit her, but I would never want to use a mannequin like this to exhibit authentic emo and scene clothes. Um, so for reference, I'm like five foot eight. So you can see in this photo that this mannequin is well over six feet tall. So that's definitely not representative of average middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, and again, in this particular area, I'm very inspired by what the Victoria and Albert Museum did in their street style exhibition, because the mannequins are very abstracted. Every ensemble in that exhibition came from an individual person, like what I'm collecting now, and it represented their individual style, even if they belonged to a subculture or a group. And so therefore, it wasn't meant to represent the ideal body. And the heads of these mannequins were abstracted metal hooks or sculptures uh, because they didn't want to recreate the hairstyles and cosmetics that went with these styles because they felt that authentic photographs of these people who participated in these styles did a better job of portraying that. And so similarly, for my project, I propose um, including a section for hairstyling and cosmetics that would heavily rely on photos and videos uploaded to the internet and social media. And there are still, you know, emo and scene hair and makeup tutorials on websites like YouTube. And this is also a really opportune area to focus on inclusivity of people of color participating in emo and scene styles. And for example, challenges trying to conform to you know the very eurocentric parts of these styles like having very straight hair and um, how that is different for different people and other elements in the project that i also want to include would be you know what would go in an exhibition catalog but also you know who would be ideal people to interview 
And there's huge potential to crowdsource and collect oral histories as well regarding these styles. So the grand finale is that my thesis proposal was approved by the board. Um, so I'm very continue, sorry, I'm very excited to continue uh, fleshing out all of the details of this project. I'm so excited to write the qualifying paper and I'm so excited to graduate. And who knows, maybe one day I will even get to put the exhibition on. So that is my presentation. Beautiful, thank you, I appreciate that. I have, uh, I have some questions for you that I kind of jotted down. Uh, yeah. what, was your, what was your introduction to uh, emo or scene? Which one were you uh, connected to the most? Great question. Um, I've been reflecting on that because I went back and tried to look at photographs of myself at the time, um, particularly in 2009. And I was about 13 years old, so very young. And when I look back at photographs, I realized that I was the only person I knew who participated in this style, which is so interesting because then it, I, I had the realization that I had only ever seen these styles on the internet and I didn't have any friends in person who subscribed to them. And I definitely identified more with scene than emo because I loved the Hello Kitty and sort of uh, childish elements of that style. But like I said in the presentation, they were very confused. So, you know, I would be called emo by some or called scene or asked, am I emo or scene or asked what's the difference between them? And there was kind of an unspoken rule or it was kind of a spoken rule actually that you could never admit that you, per like you would say, I'm not emo. Or I'm not seen. Um, so it's like a complicated question to answer, but that's my answer. It's a trick question. <laughs> um, how? What would be the takeaway for um, a spectator to, to that travels to your exhibit? What, what do you think they should uh, walk away with? What, what was the sort of cultural significance, or what do you think you want somebody to walk away with understanding your exhibit? Yeah, that's the question, right? That's the question that everyone has to ask when they're um, doing an exhibition. I think part of the takeaway is when it comes to youth culture and subculture, um, but particularly youth culture, you know, every youth culture of the past, it just says so much about what was happening in that moment you know, they're all very historically specific, which is what Dick Hebdige writes in his book about subculture, that subcultures are historically specific responses to current events and what's happening in the main culture. And so something I would want to impress upon people is like why this was the response by youth to what was happening in the early 2000s. Um, but also more of a superficial level of like if people visited with their own memories of emo and scene, I I want that to be something that people would connect with. Absolutely. Um, I feel like uh, my recollection of that whole era was sort of the, the almost like maybe the, I wouldn't say the dawning of the internet age, but definitely uh, that first generation that really utilized the internet. Uh, how would you, how would you art, I guess you did talk about how you would uh, include some of YouTube videos, but how would you archive that kind of stuff that feels almost like digitally ephemeral? Yeah, so that is um, an issue and it's something that I am absolutely going to have to think so much in depth when I'm writing this paper because even finding photographs for my presentation it is difficult because you think of, for example, MySpace was a very, um, a, a huge website for these styles and MySpace does not exist the way that it did. Um, one of the photos, the photo that I had to represent scene style, which is of um, a scene queen named Kiki Cannibal, I did manage to get that off of her MySpace in the way that it is still existing, but it was really glitchy. So many of the photos disappeared. 
um, that it's it's like there are things out there on YouTube and on the internet, but so much of it really has been lost, which is so crazy because you know part of uh, the digital age is you think oh you know the internet is forever, and now I'm frustrated like but it's not because <laughs> I can't find these things anymore. Right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to see your exhibit when it does come to life. I hope it does. Thank you so I'm much. Sure it will. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, call upon Rebecca Ranza. Is Rebecca in the room? Hey, yes, Rebecca. Yes, how right are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Very nice. Um, I am... Uh, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself, just like a previous student. If you could just uh, give us a little intro, we'll go from there and just go into your presentation. See, in my presentation, I made a whole slide. I'm, I'm very prepared, you know? I made a whole slide about my intro. Okay, so I'm Sam Rebecca. I'm a Fashion Studies MA candidate. And my title is Party Girl Fashion Through 1990s New York City Club Girls which is, you know, just sounds so fun. Doesn't it sound so fun? And I made a little collage of, um, if you guys, I'm going to talk about it later, but the movie Party Girl, 1995, amazing goddamn movie, you know? Like, this movie is about a party girl who becomes a librarian, and it's really inspired me to get into this whole niche of, like, hmm, like, I know the club kids. I know these people. I know, like, um, Paris is Burning. But what about like the women who are like the party girls, like the girls they would bring along to like get into clubs and stuff like that, you know? But I have some really cool pictures from different clubs in New York City. It just, it just so it just looks so fun, you know? Like Studio Fifty Four, wherever, wherever, blah blah blah, you know? Okay, so here's my background. I um have a degree in history. I did my thesis on mini skirts and liberation, how second wave feminism affected sixties and seventies women's fashions. And then I spent a year at Sarah Lawrence doing women's history. And I really got into researching the Perry Ellis 1993 spring collection that Marc Jacobs designed. And it, I, I got like obsessed with it. I had a whole semester of work about this, you know? I'll, I'll talk about it next slide. But, and that's where like, my love of like 1990s fashion started. And I remember someone told me like, Rebecca, like this is history. You can't do 1990s, that's not history. And I'm like, I was born in 1997. Like, this is history to me. It was 30 years ago at this point. Like, this is definitely, like, people are talking about it. People are doing this, that, blah, blah, blah. And now I've started the new school and the fashion studies program. I'm about to complete my first year, and I'm very excited. You know, it's fun. It's great. So, next. Okay. And then the Perry Ellis, um, this collection, like, if for those who aren't familiar, because I'm sure, like, 99% of you are not, it was like grunge on the runway. Mark Jacobs went to St. Mark's, which is actually the street I live on in New York, and he bought $2 flannels. He remade them in, Paris, in um, Europe with luxury materials. So it was kind of like cashmere sweaters and like silk dresses and this and that with like Converse and Birkenstocks and all this stuff. And as you can see, like it looks like there's grunge on the runway. And critics really did not like it. Like they said, like um, they handed out pins saying grunge is ghastly, like ghastly. And then Kathy Horn, famous, famous critic, you know, she wrote an awful review being like, really like this, you know? And then she changed her mind in 2015. And she was like, actually, like, it wasn't that bad, you know? Because he, Mark Jacobs, he got fired that year from his job at Perry Ellis because of the show, but he won like a award for women's like wear designer of the year from the CD, CFDA. And he also like women's wear daily said like guru of grunge, you know, and grunge was popping up. He it, obviously we all know like Kurt Cobain, his friends started in Seattle, et cetera, et cetera. It was funny, Mark actually sent his clothes from the collection to Kurt Cobain and him and Courtney Love burned them. They were like, mm, like, no, this is not grunge. Like, this is not, this is like high fashion, rich people, blah, 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 you know? And it, they just like did not approve of it. 
and they didn't like it, critics didn't like it, but now we look back at it with such a different light. The reason I got into it is because on Vogue Runway, they say this is the number one most influential show of the 90s. So I was like, hmm, if this is the most influential show, like, like I was just reading one day, and I was like, then what is this about? Like, what's going on with this? So, you know, I got into that, and it was, I wrote a whole semester to work on it, and it was just so fascinating to me how important it was in fashion, how it showed, like, what people were doing. Like, it was a subculture popping up, like, especially tied, we were talking about music earlier, tied to music, of course, you know? And then what people were wearing is, like, into that. And, like, even nowadays, like, fashion is very cyclical. Nowadays, who doesn't love their Doc Martens and their flannels and their slip dresses? Like, who doesn't love them, you know? And but, how, did the, and, uh, how did the club elements uh, come into play here? Well, it comes into play because what people were wearing to the clubs, like these young women, they were wearing like these similar types of clothing. And this was, a grunge was very short lived though. It was only like maybe like a year in New York that it was like grunge. Not only Mark Jacobs did a collection, but so many other people did collections. And it was like very like, it went up and then it went down. Okay, yeah. So I, I, I did my work on that, just became obsessed with that. And it really got me into 1990s fashion and so many other things in the 90s. Like, there were so many trends, like minimalism, this, that, blah, 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 you know? But then my next slide, let me try to figure this out. Okay, beautiful. Um, I wrote an essay on New York City clubbing, um, and it was on Studio 54, Mud Club, and Club 57 in my Fashion Everyday Life course. And Studio 54, we all know, like we all heard Studio 54. It was glitz, it was glam, it was this, it was that, it was perfection, you know? But then I got into the other clubs. Mud Club was in Tribeca, which is downtown. And it was kind of like cool art people, like Andy Warhol went there, and like um, different people, like Keith Haring, you know, different people like that, like went there because they were like, okay, we see Studio Fifty Four, we're kind of like for, going for a different vibe, you know. And so, but um, Club Fifty Seven also right down the street from me. I walk every single day. I go on my daily walks. I walk by the plaque that says Club Fifty Seven and where it was, like on 57 St. Mark's. And it says all the people, like the patrons, and it was in the basement of what's now a hospital. So interesting to me, thinking like, this is my life, I'm walking through every day. What if I was alive in 1980, where like this was a club, and this club was the punk club. It was the complete, it was like the opposite of Studio 54, anti-glam, anti-glitz. They had crazy themes. Let me get to my next slide. I'll show you one of the posters. They had truckers ball. Like it just like crazy things that you wouldn't even imagine. Like we're just having fun with it. We're living life or experiencing it. And there's different pictures from the clubs. And um, I used um, Veblen, um, Thorstein Veblen's theories of the leisure class to analyze all of this. And I have like a quote from one of my papers, um, very professional. But Veblen focused on how fashion is used to communicate power by showing off but what he missed is when you are forced to the margins, drawing attention to yourself as an act of self-love. Revlin wrote about wealthy people already have the power, and that's fair enough. But using the creative agency style and fabulousness allows marginalized people to empower themselves as a triple act of defiance, confidence, and self-love. This was from this great book by Madison Moore, Fabulous. Amazing. You should all read it. And it's all about the theory of fabulous and how kind of like what it is, what it isn't, what people showed and like how the clubbing scene, the nightlife scene played a part into it. It really showed the nightlife of the masses, you know? Once you're free to be yourself, you can dress however you want. Like you go to your job, you're nine to five, you wear a suit, you wear this, you wear that, you go out after and you can wear anything. And it really was just such an escape for people, especially marginalized folks, especially LGBTQ plus folks, you know? And it really showed the other side, but also there was a huge like, factor of like drugs, sex, that really played a part into the clubbing scene. Like you wouldn't have clubs without that. But fabulousness is important because it shows how marginalized people create like their worlds 
in this new space. And otherwise, these people are invisible in society and they're made visible by going out, doing this, doing that, you know. And then on my next paper I wrote, um, also connected, which is funny, I love this paper. Um, it girls and the it clothes they wear, the relationship between it girls and the fashion system. It girls kind of are like a thing throughout time. They started in 1910s the movie it girl with clara bow who was like the first it girl and we've had them ever since then now we would call them the modern day like influencers you know we, we all know what influencers are and they really have like a true combination of like style fame taste and it allows them to be people that people look up to i in my paper talked about how they were cultural intermediaries cultural intermediaries impact how consumers act how they shop, how they can, how they consume, you know? And we're influenced by it girls. Like you, you see someone in a magazine wearing a certain pair of pants or a shirt, and you're like, oh, I, I want those pants. I want this shirt, you know? And in between like consumption and production, it girls have their place. It's like a relationship between culture and economy, and they exist within that. Thank you so much for all they're of your input on club culture throughout the 90s. May I please uh, speak to Kyra Streck? Is Kyra in the room? Kira, I would imagine. Kira. Yeah. Kira, my bad. Thank no, you. No, it's okay. <laughs> how are you, Kira? I'm doing all right. All right. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and uh, go straight into your presentation? Yeah. Um. So. Uh, my name is Kira. Um. I am originally from Connecticut. Um, I went to Cornell University for my undergrad. I graduated last year uh, with a bachelor's in uh, fashion design and merchandising. Um, and now I'm at Iowa State completing my master's in um, apparel merchandising and design. So I'm one year in and that's kind of, that's me. So. Beautiful, thank you. So my project is titled um, 21st century queer, uh, visibly queer and trans fashion brands and oral history project. Um, so I created this project in collaboration with Drs. Kelly Reddy Best and Jennifer Gordon from Iowa State University. Um, so in the kind of lower right or lower left hand corner, you can see this little bunny image, um, which is a QR code if you are familiar with that. Um, so that's just for um, citation purposes. So if you would like to see where any of these images are from, you can just hover your phone camera over that and then a link will pop up um, kind of in the upper bar of your phone. So if you want to follow that link and see any of the sources, um, you may do that. Thank you. Um, so prior to the 21st century, there were very few fashion designers and brands creating products that overtly targeted the queer and trans communities. Uh, however, in the beginning of the 21st century, numerous fashion brands catering to queer and trans people began to rapidly emerge in the industry. So pictured here are some of these entrepreneurs. Uh, the purpose of our research was to document and analyze these emerging fashion brands by examining their histories, product offerings, and intersections with queerness. Pictured here are the 23 brand logos um, that we completed oral histories with on their development, production, and sale of clothing, accessories, and other appearance-related objects. Some of these brands included All is Fair and Love and Wear, Beefcake Swimwear, Blue Stockings Boutique, The Butch Clothing Company, as well as many others. To obtain a rich history of the 23 companies and their respective directors, founders, and owners, we used the oral history method with a life history approach. So we created an online open source archive for the oral histories, which is pictured on this slide. We prompted the interviewees to use storytelling, which is a key component of oral history, to share the history of their company, starting from the initial idea and also how their own personal life history connected to how and why they started or became involved with the company. In our analysis, we drew upon these oral histories, objects from each company, news articles, and other online content, such as YouTube videos. So a little bit of context, um, from colonization until the early 1970s in the United States, queer and trans rights were virtually non-existent. In the latter part of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries, activists achieved major advances for queer and trans rights, providing much visibility for the community. 
for example, in 1996, states began legalizing same-sex marriage, which was met with significant backlash. Following this legisl legislation, the United States almost immediately passed the Defense of Marriage Act, also known as DOMA, legally defining marriages between a man and a woman. Then in 2013, the United States Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. However, many other iniquities persist for the queer and trans community. This long-standing oppressive context in which these queer and trans fashion brands emerged is of great importance to demonstrate their revolutionary status as they developed between 2009 and 2017 in the wake of continued turbulence and activism. Um, at the time of their respective founding, some of the directors could not find garments, accessories, or shoes that fit their gender expression, or they knew others in the queer and trans communities who experienced similar issues. This inspired them to develop their brands. For example, two cisgender tomboy identifying women found Kieran Finch because they were unable to find button down shirts that fit their desired self presentation. Um, additionally, the brands producing suits and suit coordinates were also responding to the emerging queer wedding market. Most of the brand directors did not have backgrounds or initial interests to work in the fashion industry. Their work histories varied. For example, Cadillac at Blue Stockings Boutique was a PhD student in literature. Krakauer from Let's Be Brief previously worked in healthcare management. And Brittner Wells from Beat Cake Swimwear worked in youth programming. The director's personal histories and involvement in the queer and trans communities was arguably one of the central motivations to start their brands. After the internet was developed in 1977, it significantly changed the clothing, accessory, and shoe retail landscape. E-commerce quickly became a large part of retail sales. Customers can now purchase on demand as more brands such as Dapper Boy sold direct to consumer through their website. Then, at the beginning of the 21st century, niche fashion brands such as Hot Topic, which was kind of a spot for a lot of scene and emo kids at the time, uh, and Abercrombie and & Fitch proliferated. Uh, after the 2008 financial crisis, many nascent brands turned to crowdfunding platforms such as Kickstarter, which launched in 2009, allowing community-based fundraising. Simultaneously, social media became a part of Americans' everyday lives, allowing easy public access to Kickstarter campaigns. These changes in the retail industry included e-commerce, social media, niche brands, and crowdfunding, which all contributed in part to the market entry for the 23 queer and trans brands in this study. Many of the products offered by these queer and trans brands have historically been unavailable because they subvert gen normative gender appearances, a common aesthetic many queer individuals have negotiated throughout history. For example, um, documented evidence suggests that women in same-gender relationships dressed in a masculine-leaning style since at least the late 19th century. Pictured here is Sarah Panosby and Eleanor Butler, who were two women in an intimate relationship who dressed in a masculine aesthetic in the 19th century. Contemporary masculine styles, often referred to as butch, frequently include flat shoes, short haircuts, and masculine-coated clothing. Alternatively, feminine-leaning lesbians, often referred to as femme, more commonly have longer hair, wear makeup, and wear feminine coded clothing. Therefore, clothing, which contains a myriad of gender codes and our interactions with clothing are integral parts of gender negotiation processes for queer and trans people, and these brands cater to these unique negotiations. Each brand typically specialized in one or two products or service categories. For example, Outplay Swimwear designed swimwear. Twee Custom Clothier created suits and suit coordinates. The brand directors addressed the unmet queer and trans fashion market needs by querying existing products. Tomboy X's customers requested boxer briefs for women. Therefore, the brand launched an underwear line with the masculine silhouettes that fit people with varying genital anatomy. For example, the six inch fly, one of their popular items pictured here, featured a non-functioning fly with buttons, front panels that were smaller than those in men's underwear, and a six inch inseam which is longer than most underwear marketed to people assigned female at birth. These queer and trans fashion products are not merely copies of products typically marketed to cisgender men with discrete modifications, but reinterpreted products reflecting Munoz's concept of disidentification from queer theory. Disidentification allows one to destabilize cultural norms and power dynamics and imagine alternate sociocultural relationships. Disidentification refashions cultural objects and ideas by emphasizing their complex position 
and centers marginalized people and their experiences in relation to these objects. In the process of making garments, such as masculine coated suits, accessible to people with varying body types, the directors reinterpreted these garments. Uh, many of the brands produce garments associated with masculine presentation, such as suits, boxer briefs, and button down shirts. Each of these are reinterpretations of existing garments associated with hegemonic masculinity. For masculine of center people, wearing these garments helps them achieve their desired masculine embodiment. For example, FTM Essentials sold rodeo boxers, which unlike traditional men's boxers, the crotch panel was double layered to allow for the insertion of a packer. The outer layer had an O-ring in the middle, allowing the boxers to also serve as a harness for hard packing. While several brands offered masculine leading products, some designed and or sold feminine leading or gender neutral products. For example, Flaunt Streetwear marketed their t-shirts as gender neutral. Rebirth garments offered packing underwear and binders in addition to other products. However, their work characterized a gender fuck aesthetic by incorporating neon color blocking and silhouettes that revealed often concealed parts of the body. Many of the products received positive feedback from queer and trans community members. For example, Nick Casey of Nick Casey Footwear explained, one client for the first time felt like they didn't have children's feet because they were finally wearing shoes that looked proportionate to their body. These reactions emphasize the importance of identity affirming garments and how previous market options inadequately address their needs. Um, many of the brands, including Tomboy X, GC2B, and Rebirth Garments, gained initial visibility through word of mouth, yet digital media facilitated an exponential growth in popularity and the ability to reach their intended communities. Uh, the brands all received free press from the emerging online queer-focused fashion lifestyle media, such as Auto Straddle and Dapper Q, which were both established in 2009, and Qwear, which was established in 2011. Part of Qwear's mission is to elevate independent brands and designers review clothing, and educate the mainstream fashion industry about queer identities. Dapper Q's founder, Anita Dolce Vita, explained that Dapper Q is a queer fashion revolution, one of the most stylish forms of protest of our generation. These queer fashion media platforms work to enhance the brand's profiles through digital social justice work. Technological changes in the latter 20th and early 21st centuries on social media has helped facilitate the rise of these queer and trans brands in the 2010s, as most of them operated as e-commerce businesses. Dunaway and Gonzalez of Tomboy X recruited brand representatives to promote products on the representatives' personal social media pages. Dominique and Honig of All is Fair and Love and Wear prioritized creating a digital environment that considered their customers' well-being because they understood how daunting it could be for customers to search for trans supportive gear. For example, they outlined binding health safety practices on their Instagram in collaboration with the Binding Health Project, which was a research project resulting in numerous peer-reviewed research articles. Social justice-centered representation was key as brands developed their online presence. Many of them actively ob rejected objectification of the body and their imagery. Some brands focused on sexual empowerment and some avoided advertising the product on a body. Dysak from FTM Essentials explained that she does not typically advertise products on a body. For example, she photographs packers alongside her hand for size comparison. Dysak's approach helps her customers evaluate packer sizes and reduce potential negative comparisons her customer might make between themselves and the model. Playout Apparel also produced a campaign with models who had mastectomies without reconstructive surgery. Erica Hart, a famous model who had a mastectomy without reconstructive surgery, walked for Tomboy X in Dapper Q's annual runway show during New York Fashion Week in 2017. The directors also discussed the importance of and tensions surrounding inclusive language in their media and product copy. For example, Kubaku used the term innie bits and outie bits to refer to genitals. Circumventing gendered language by abstractly referring to anatomy rejects cis normativity allowing queer and trans customers to feel affirmed and recognized. While the brands contributed to queer and trans representation in media and the industry, they continually engaged in critical reflection on their business choices. Some handled significant controversy related to digital media representations. For example, Cadillac assumed that using the word queer for blue stocking boutique would agree with a mostly millennial audience. However, the word triggered significant backlash, so she removed the word queer from her brand's media.
Um, although the directors thought critically about inclusive imagery and language, their digital media received both positive and negative reactions. The safe space Washington created on GC2B's social media has facilitated positive trans community building. Washington explained that once trans communities find something that works, they're going to want to share it with other people. It's not competitive and people know how relieving it is to have it. So they're more than willing to share that with other people and spread the word. GC2B benefited from this digital community building as they received free marketing. Washington explained some of his customers are quote, self-proclaimed marketers as these community interactions may not have been happening in the same way without the existence of GC2B, their trans products and their social media platforms. Similarly, Kubaku branded themselves as the face of rebirth garments. Customers have told Kubaku that the brand's digital visibility inspired them to come out Therefore, GC2B and Rebirth Garments digital marketing techniques help facilitate acceptance and increased confidence for queer and trans people, which is in contrast with mainstream marketing norms that often center heteronormativity and cisgenderism. Kubakub explained, you know that's just what we've been trained to do in the world. You're just expecting to not be affirmed. The United States government has increasingly expanded the rights of queer and trans community members, and the internet revolutionized easier and less costly funding, marketing, and retailing methods for emerging brands. Due to these and other factors, some entrepreneurs, including those with no prior experience in the fashion industry and who mostly identified within the queer and trans communities, were able to build their respective fashion brands filling industry gaps. The directors queered existing designs on online spaces reimagining them to assist queer and trans people with expressing their authentic selves. Through this research project, we document the changing retail landscape and the revolutionary queer and trans fashion brand movement in the 21st century, analyzing the relationships between queer and trans people, queer history, and retail history allows for a deeper understanding of queer identity within society which can assist in developing cultural competence and thus reducing future discrimination. While we captured rich histories, the oral histories are a cross section in time. As the companies continue to evolve and more brands enter the industry, future scholars should continue to capture these important and revolutionary stories. We invite you to further explore these queer and trans fashion brands in the oral history archive online found at the link on the screen. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was very thorough. That was a uh, that was very educational, and I actually don't have a lot to ask because I feel like every time I thought of writing something down, you answer the question for me. So thank you so much for that. I want to thank you all. I appreciate you guys inviting me to be here, and thank you so much for your presentation, Kira. It's really great to hear from this younger group of scholars, the next generation of hopefully CSA, the next generation of CSA leadership, and the next generation of costume scholars um, around the country. Um, uh, so without further ado, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Um, if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow CSA on social media so that you can um, attend more of our webinars in the future. With that, uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.